The Afternoon, page three. When I turned back to the house, my father called after me and asked me, did I figure out that I was finished? I figure so, I said, and then my father said, in that way he has of saying something that cuts you down to half of your size or less, slow to start and quick to finish. He said it plain and quiet, but it was a piece of, it was a, of a piece, and it reminded me that I couldn't think of a time when he had said something pleasing or gentle with love or concern, and I replied to him, but not out loud, for which I didn't have the guts at all. If just once in all my born days you would say a good thing to me, then maybe I'd show good to you and be able to do what you want me to do and maybe read your mind or your soul. But aloud I said nothing, just began to walk toward the house, and his voice coiled me like a whip around my ankle. Adam, yes, sir. I'll have you talk to me face to face, not into the air with your back to me. Yes, sir, I said, turning around. Draw your mother's evening water and bring it to her. Wasted steps are like wasted thoughts, just as empty and just as ignorant. Yes, father, I said, and then I went to the house and picked up the yoke and walked with it to the well. The sun was cutting. That's the time of the day when the wind stops, and the air is so sweet you can taste it and suck it. But that afternoon, the time of day made me think about death, and I saw a chicken hawk in flight and waited for someone somewhere to send a load of birdshot after it, but no one did. I thought of death and was full of fear, and I just wanted to sit down somewhere and put my face in my hands and give in to the terrible, frightened feeling I had, but I didn't. I have all kinds of strange thoughts and feelings of that sort, and I guess I never talked to anyone about them, except perhaps a little to Granny, because I didn't really believe that anyone in the world had ever just kind of same kind of thoughts. When I drew the water from the well, I said the spell to take the curse off water. Holy ghost and holy hell, get thee out of the mossy well. My father once heard me say that spell, and he took me into the barn and gave me seven with the birch rod. He hated spells and said they were worse than an instrument of the devil. They were an instrument of ignorance. And I was foolish enough to answer back that if he was so sure about all kinds of superstition, why did he birch me seven times, not eight or six? That was the way it was in the whole town. When you got the rod taken to you, you got it seven times. I should have known enough to keep my mouth shut because he replied that he was gratified to be enlightened and laid on to me 10 times more and then wanted to know whether I deemed my deem 17 to be a superstitious number. So now I said the spell qu quietly, just moving my lips. A spell has no meaning if you only think it to yourself and never voice it. But quiet or not, my brother Levi, who is 11 years old, has cat's eyes. He popped up and demanded a drink from the bucket. Draw your own water, I told him. Don't be high and mighty. I see you saying the spell. How would you like me to tell father that I see you saying the spell? You're a little bastard, I told him. Sure, and what did you just call your mother? All right, take your drink and leave me be. Why don't you just stay out of my sight? I'd be happy to God if you'd only stay out of my sight. I took a drink too. The water is always best, cold and crackling, when you first draw it. When I came into the house, mother was frying donkers, and the kitchen was full of the smell. You save a week's meat leftovers to make donkers, then it's chopped together with bread and apples and raisins and savory spices and fried and served up with boil pitting. I don't know of anything better. When my mother saw me come in with the yolk, she took the water off and smiled her gratitude. You're a good boy, she said. I didn't tell her that it wasn't my idea. I needed for someone to think something good about me, and I didn't want to disturb her thinking. When I ate some of the raw meat stuff, she slapped my hand. When I sat down, she said, are you going to stay here and fill my head with your nonsense? What nonsense? I haven't said a word. That's just it, Adam. You sit there with that look in your eyes. And just as plain as daylight, I can see what kind of silly dream you're contemplating. When I was your age, if a boy had an hour between the, the chores and mealtime, he spent it with profit reading the Holy Grit. Granny told me how your father, just about your age, set, him a, set himself a disciplined period to memorize three verses of lamentations every evening. Lamentations? And he did. Well, good heavens, what on earth did he want to memorize the verses of lamentations every evening for? To profit himself. And let me tell you this, Adam, she said. I don't hold with the narrow views of some, but it seems to me that an expression like good heavens is precious close to swearing. It seems to me that the king's English is abundant enough to express every necessary shade of feeling and impatience without resorting to words that have sincere meaning when used properly. Have you been fighting with your brother again? Now what gave you that idea? I didn't wait for her to tell me, but she got up and began to stalk out the way I had come. She had to know where I was going. Just to find Granny. She's upstairs. I went upstairs, and when Granny was in her room making thread, when I entered, she blinked at me and said, I see less and less. Old age is pity enough, 
but when the eyesight goes, the good Lord is laying a heavy burden on my poor shoulders. Well, Granny, I replied, I don't think your eyesight is going. It's just getting dark in here because the twilight has come down. Is that so, Adam? Sure enough. Well, then, I've spun sufficiently, she declared. Sit down, Adam. Do you want some sweets? I sat down on her old milking stool, which she had decorated with paint and turned into one of the prettiest things in the house, and reminded her that there was a widely held opinion to the effect that sweets before mealtime spoil an appetite. Oh, she said, I'm sure we'd all be rich if I could devise something to spoil your appetite, Adam. Then she went to the cupboard and got out the cotton kerchief that she always wrapped the maple sugar in, and she broke off a piece for each of us. I ate it slowly and appreciatively, and asked her whether it was true about my father and lamentations. It's true. Well, what for? I mean, what was his purpose? To profit himself. That's what mother said, but I'll be damned if I can see the profit in it. You will be damned, Adam, if you go on with such talk, I shrugged. And don't act as if you don't care. I don't think we keep saying things we don't mean at all, Granny. Do we? And what sort of things, Adam? Like being damned. Do you believe in God, Granny? What a question, she snorted with great indignation. In all my born days, Adam Cooper, I have never seen a boy like yourself for asking questions. Well, do you? Of course I do. Well, I don't know. Adam Cooper, you are not going to start in again with all that silly nonsense of yours, are you? Just one thing. Just answer me one thing, Granny. That's all I'm asking. I just want you to answer me one thing. What is it that they're always taking it out on me for whatever I say? Like there's nothing in the world I can do right and everything I do is all wrong. My goodness, the things you say, Adam. Well, look at it this way, Granny. You believe in God, don't you? Enough of that. If you believe in God, then God gave a personal brains, didn't he? Of course. But just as soon as you begin to use the brains God gave you, you're being sinful. That's just the sort of foolish thing you say, Adam, that's so provoking. Well, just take Isaiah Pinkerton, for example. Oh, no, she said, her eyes narrowing. I am not going to be trapped in the Isaiah Pinkerton thing. It just happens that I was gathering blueberries the other day, and there you were down in the gully with Ruth Simmons, instructing her about Isaiah Pinkerton, and I overheard enough. Didn't you see us, Granny? I didn't have to see you, as if I didn't know that Cooper voice of yours anywhere. I sighed with relief and told her that even if I had gone into it a little with Ruth Simmons, that didn't make it any less of a fact. It just seems to me, Adam, Granny said, that shaking a body loose from her faith is about the most sinful thing you could do. Granny, I wasn't shaking anybody loose from anybody's faith. I'd like you to tell me how old Isaiah can be as mean and wicked and two-faced as he is and be a deacon in the church and be looked up as a good, real fine God-fearing man. I mean, he can get away with anything just so long as he says the right words about religion. It's not for you to judge Isaiah Pinkerton. I wasn't judging him, I protested. Everyone knows how rich and mean he is. So how could I be judging him? Anyway, in Boston when we were there a fortnight past, there was a man talking right on the common and he said that the highest good was to doubt. Just like that, in those very words. I never heard such nonsense. If he said that, he was nobody worth quoting. He was a committeeman, Granny. I don't believe a word of it. Cross my heart, Granny. Don't you dare cross your heart to me, she snapped. Just like you was Roman or some other heathen sect. And don't think that because I'm old and rheumatic and grateful for your foolish company that you can say anything you please in front of me. You can't cousin me with a pretense at stupidity, not in one in a thousand years. You're a spiteful boy, and that's why your father loses patience with you. He doesn't lose patience, Granny. He doesn't have any patience to begin with. There. And this was a committeeman, I said. So? Well, just tell me this. Was he a Sam Adams committeeman? I admitted, admitted that he was most likely a Sam Adams committee man, and she shrugged her shoulders and said there wasn't anything else a body could expect, seeing that Sam Adams was an atheist, and so were all of his cronies. Granny had a good mind, and I guess that was one of the reasons why I enjoyed provoking her. The other reason was that she would stand for being provoked, and practically no one else would. Now, if he had said, Adam, she went on, that one of the past was to good was a certain amount of doubt and common sense, there might be some reason to his thoughts. Then he would have been sensible. But doubt is a negative thing, and good is a positive thing. And anyone who says that both are the same thing is simply a fool. And there you are. That's it exactly, Granny. When you disagree with someone, you straight out and call them a fool. But when I disagree, I get my ears pinned back. I'm older than you, Adam, by a year or two. You said yourself that age doesn't teach most folks a blessed thing. Don't tell me what I said. If you propose to remain as narrow and opinionated as you are now all the years of your life, well, that's your choice. Most folks are one thing. I should hope that my grandson would be something else. At that moment, mother called me from below that supper was ready, and I gave Granny my arm and helped her down the stairs. Her rheumatism was getting worse and worse. 
As we went down the staircase, myself a little in front of her because the staircase was so narrow, she said to me, don't ever talk most to me, Adam. Most folks are not Coopers, and most folks do not live in this village or in this country either. Most folks are not dissenters, and most folks would just as soon find a chain to put around their necks, considering one wasn't there already. Coopers have been teachers and pastors and free yeoman farmers and ship captains and merchants for 150 years on this soil. And I don't recall one of them who couldn't write a sermon and deliver it too, if the, ever, the need ever arose. Well, maybe you're leaning on the first one, Granny, I said. On weekdays, we ate our meals in the kitchen. On the Sabbath, we ate dinner in the dining room, and Mother set the table with china and silver. We weren't rich, but Granny's mother had been rich enough for china and silver. On weekdays, we ate with plainware. Although there were only five of us in the immediate family, our table was always set with places for six. Mother at one end, father at the other, Granny facing the two boys. The empty chair was next to Granny. My father claimed that the empty chair was, as he put it, a manifesto of hospitality, an invitation to anyone who crossed our threshold at mealtime. And I must admit that many a guest sat there, knowing that the welcome was ready at the Coopers, the fo food good and the cooking beyond compare. But my father's real purpose was an audience, and if possible, an argument. There wasn't anyone in his own family whom he considered really worth arguing with. And as far as plain discourse was concerned, Although we were a disciplined and trained audience, he could never be wholly sure that we were listening, and if listening, comprehending. My own opinion was that Granny could win hands down in any argument, but she would not argue with her son in front of his own children. She also felt that one of her sex tended to be unladylike and pushy when she ventured on the finer points of the divine, ordinary, and inherent rights of man, which was mainly the subject. Tonight, however, we had no guest at the beginning of the meal, and the five of us sat down and four of us bent our heads while Father said grace. He didn't hold with bending his head at grace or any other time, and when Granny once raised the point with him, he replied that one of the many differences between ourselves and the Pappas and high church people, who were a shade worse than Pappas, was that whereas the latter two sects cringed and groveled before the clay and plaster images they worshipped, we stood face to face with our God as befitting what he had created in his own image." Granny said that there was possibly some difference between cringing and groveling and a polite bending of the head from the neck, but father wasn't moved. The difference was quantitative and therefore only a matter of degree. To him it was a principle. In two minutes, my father could lead any argument or a discussion around to being a principle. So he sat, said grace glaring across the table as, at the imaginary point where he placed God, and I always felt that God had the worst of it. My father couldn't just begin a meal with something direct and ordinary, like, thank thee, O Lord, for thy daily bread and the fruit of the harvest. Oh, no, no. He had to embellish it. If there was no guest at that meal, God was always present. And tonight my father said sternly, we thank thee, O Lord, for the bread we eat, but we are also conscious of seed we have planted and the hands of the hands that guided the plow and the back bent in toil. The ground is dry as dust, and I will take the liberty of asking for a little rain. I know that thou givest with one hand, and thou takest away with another, but sometimes it seems to me to go beyond the bounds of reason. Amen. Then he turned to his soup. Granny lifted her head and stared at him, and finally said, Moses? Yes, mother? She sighed, and we all began to eat. Yes, mother? Nothing, Granny said. Nothing at all. Whatever is on your mind, mother, I would appreciate your coming out with it and saying it. Eat your soup, Moses, she sighed. He was inordinately fond of soup. And during the soup, he left the conversation to the women and children. I did not have much to say to Levi, being occupied with my own thoughts, some of them about Ruth Simmons, and also some thoughts about going to sea. If you had respectable kin in Boston, it was generally understood that one of the younger sons would go to sea and learn the trade, since there was no better way to end up with a fine house and a wife in silks and laces, and good imported furniture as well as standing in the community. I was not a younger son, but one day in Boston, Captain Ishmael Jameson, my uncle on my mother's side, had felt my muscles, asked a number of questions, and finished by wondering how I would like to sign on with him as bottom junior on a voyage to the Indies. I was remembering this, contemplating it, and speculating on whether there weren't more interesting girls in the world than Ruth Simmons, whom I had seen at least every day of my life. I also kept in the back of my mind a picture of my father's rage if I came out with so much as a hint about going out to sea. At the same time, Mother and Granny talked about the quilt competition. There were those in the village who held that any sort of competition was vain and sinful, and no better than another form of pride. Granny put out, put out that it was pure nonsense that the acknowledgement that one person did something better than another was sinful. She made the best and most colorful quilts in town, and had been quietly pumping for a competition for years. It's not for the sake of a prize or money, Granny said. 
I do suppose that if there was something to be won or gained, it might be likened to a form of gambling. What's this about gambling, my father demanded. He had finished his soup. If Sarah Livingston could win, not likely, since she can't th sew three stitches straight, we'd have the contest, she being married to the elder. Be sure of that, mother said. Gambling? Eat your supper, Granny told father. What is a turkey shoot but gambling and sin? What is the lottery they hold each year in Boston? And don't tell me that only high church buys the tickets. Did I say that? I helped mother take the empty dishes off and bring on the platters of meat cakes and potatoes and parsnips and boiled pudding. You were about to, Moses. What is all this talk about gambling? It's woman talk. Pass me your plate. It did me good to see Granny treating my father as if he was half grown. She has an instinct about when he, she is, he is preparing to bear down on me, and she figured that a little humility would lessen the blows. But he also saw where the wind was blowing and didn't waste another minute. No sooner had he swallowed his first mouthful of donker than he said to me, How big are you, Adam? Tall? Do you know other ways of being big? I could have managed a clever answer to that one, but I saw the glint in his eyes and decided to accept the sameness of big and tall and not promote an argument. It had always been a wonder to me that anyone could work up a rancor towards anything while eating my mother's cooking, but when something was on father's mind, it couldn't wait. No, sir, I agreed. Then what is your height, Adam? My mother knew that my father was most ominous when he indulged in innocent and obvious questions, and she pressed him to take more boiled pudding. He cut the ground from under her by accepting another helping, but Granny said, Whatever this is, Moses, it can wait until the meal is over. Adam won't be any taller than he is right now. Levi was too silent and expectant. I began to get the drift of things. Let me decide that, Father said, and suppose you answer the question, Adam. He went on with the boiled pudding, and I decided that if we could get this all out while we were eating it, it would be less painful to everyone. I told him very seriously that I stood somewhere between 23 and 24 hands, most likely closer to 24, since I was at least two inches taller than Ebenezer Colt, who claimed he just topped 23. Tall as a man, my father nodded. Some men, I agree, and didn't think it wise to add that I was taller than most. And strong as a man. The one would think that a man's wind would go along with all that. Don't you think so, Adam? Yes, sir. I mean, it appears to make sense. Only appears so, Adam? Father says, asks softly. Oh, have some donkers, Granny said. All this is going to interfere with your digestion. You know, know that, Moses. I asked Adam a question. Yes, sir, I nodded. How long is a man supposed to watch his son in wonder? I don't know, sir. Do you expect me to take you out and birch you? No, sir. I'm a little large for that, I whimpered. It wouldn't be dignified. It wouldn't do me any good either. It would get around. I'm not sparing you for the sake of your reputation among your cronies. I nodded. I know that, sir. Just as you know why I'm angry? Yes, sir. Levi couldn't keep his mouth shut. My father accepted a donker from Granny, and I took a large bite of the boiled pudding, and I know, knew that the worst was over and that for the moment I was saved. He had put punishment aside for the moment and would employ reason as his weapon. I don't know which made me feel worse and the only compensation was some speculation on what I would do to Levi. My father must have read my mind because he said, I don't want you to turn this on Levi, Adam. He did what was right. Don't you agree with me? I nodded, not trusting myself to look at Levi, and my father, now enjoying his food and digestion in the soft whip hand he had established over me, continued. Why am I angry, Adam? Is it because you repeated some foolish childish doggerel when you drew the water from the well? Hardly. I hate and despise, despise superstition, not because it is blasphemous, but because it is a display of ignorance. He let the food go as he warmed up to this. My father was a fine talker, and I guess he derived more pure pleasure from it than any other habit. We are plain people, he continued, not poor, for we are blessed with more than a necessary share of the world's goods, and we have a good house with good furniture and good food on our table, for which we thank the Lord and his mercy, but plain and thrifty people. Yet we, your mother, myself, my father, and my grandfather, we have always prided ourselves that we are in sense the people of the book. My brothers and I were raised, and I make every effort to raise my own children, not as blackguards and loafers, not as soldiers or tavern sots, but as thoughtful and res reasoning creatures, men who honor the written word, who respect intelligent writing, and who, like the ancient philosophers, look upon argumentation and disputation as avenues towards the deepest truth. I am a father who tills the soil to earn his daily bread, but there are 300 and odd books in this house, well-thumbed, well-read. Nor are my neighbors unlike me. This is why, Adam, we are what we are. We came to this land in the beginning because savagery and superstition were an abomination to us. And in the midst of a new savagery, we planted our own seed of culture and civilization. Do you understand me? He finished. Well, he may, but I don't, Granny put in decisively. And I could see that she had decided to take the bit in her teeth. 
To make a fuss just like that over the foolishness of a 15-year-old just passes my understanding. It does. Why? Believe me, I never did see a man to sit at his own supper table and be faced with the kind of food Sarah Cooper puts down in front of you, Moses Cooper, and be that ill-tempered. Now, please, mother, don't stop me in the middle of a sentence, Moses Cooper. I didn't stop you in the middle of a sentence. Not to mention pride, Granny went on. It goeth before a fall, or doesn't it? And if that wasn't the most prideful statement I'd ever listened to, then I don't know what was. A spell may be unchristian and ignorant, but let me remind you what the Testament says about pride. I know what the Testament says about pride, mother. We were interrupted at that point, or I don't know where it would have gone on to. My mother was nervous and upset over the whole thing. Levi was sunk in gloom, brooding over what I might do to him later, and very disturbed that Granny had gone after father the way she had. But I was enjoying it, the way you enjoy someone running on the edge of a high stone cliff. It's exhilarating while it lasts. It finished because Joseph Simmons, our neighbor and kin, came in and gave us his greetings and said that he would just sit down in the empty chair and watch us while we finished our evening bread. But he wouldn't have a thing to eat. A mouthful would be too much, as he had just finished his own supper. But then he saw that we were having donkers, and he admitted that he might try one. He was so ordinately fond of them, and since it didn't go alone, he'd have a mouthful of boiled pudding on the plate. Mother gave him hot meat from the fire, and it was a pleasure to see his face when he took the first bite. He was a big, heavy-set man, and I never saw anyone to match him for straightforward pleasure in food. Goody Cooper, he said to my mother, I don't recollect a more delicious meal than your donkers, but neither do I recollect any home but yours where they're favored. They're not proper English food, said mother. They're Dutch food. Now, what do you know? You see, my grandfather Isaac, he was in the coasting trade. I've heard about your grandfather Isaac indeed, said Mr. Simmons. Unlike my father, he did not have to stop eating to talk. He did both at once. He said it respectfully, but nevertheless, it gave my mother a twinge. She pretends not to know how many have heard and gossiped about her grandfather Isaac, who kept one wife and family in Boston and another wife and family in Philadelphia, but the knowledge was widespread. The fact that the Philadelphia wife was one half Shawnee Indian and he had never been baptized, as the story went, gave the gossip and added Philip. While her grandfather Isaac was alive, she couldn't bear to speak of him or listen to him being spoke of, but when he died and left her 200 sovereigns, father said that his sinfulness took a back seat to his generosity and thoughtfulness. In addition, a sea captain was never judged by the same standards we used to measure a landsman. Of course, mother nodded. Well, one day at sea, his cook died of the egg, and he put into New York Harbor and eng engaged a Holland cook. And after that, he could never sail with anything but a Holland cook, and he got a taste for du Dutch cooking in his own home. It was the Holland cook taught grandmother Zipporah things like donkers, and I got the recipes from her. One more, Cousin Supers, Cousin Sim Simmons, Granny said. He was a second cousin on the Cooper side. He said he didn't have the strength or the lasting power for another meat cake, but Mother knew as well as I did that he was saving himself for a piece of her pie. He explained that he had come by to walk with my father to the extra extraordinary committee meeting they were holding tonight. Two weeks before this, the committee had appointed him to write a statement on the rights of man, to which they would all put their names and which would be posted in Boston. In my opinion, which nobody asked, Joseph Simmons was a poor choice. He was a nice enough man, but when it came to the fine points of disputation, he simply wasn't there. He had been working on the draft of his statement for two weeks, and most likely he'd work on it two weeks more. It would have had been more natural for the committee to select my father or Deacon Loring or Mr. Harrington for the task, but my father was a company captain and all sorts of positions and title had been handed out to the others. That left Cousin Simmons for the statement. He took his draft out of his pocket now and then told father he had been waiting for an opportunity to have his considered opinion. Go ahead and read it, Joseph, father said. Cousin Simmons cleared his throat and read. We, the undersigned, holding to the positive and practical position that the rights of men are derived from the Almighty God are and sealed by his holy hand and will. He was watching Father's face, and his voice died away. Well, Moses, he said tentatively, go ahead and read. Granny and Mother were dishing the pie and putting the plates on the table. Cousin Simmons couldn't resist tasting it. Go on and read, I said. Well, what's the use of reading? Why don't you come out and say what's on your mind? I can't go on reading with your face all screwed up in disagreement, Granny said. I can't see what's to disagree with when you've hardly begun. I wasn't disagreeing, Father said. I was just thinking that when you leave church, theology won't hold water. I don't argue against a man's religion, and I don't want him to dispute me with his religion. For heaven's sake, Granny said, Cousin Simmons no more than read the preamble. Just as important as any of the rest of it. And how have I been disputing you with religion, Moses? I'd like you to make that plain. Rights derive from God. That's no argument. That's a swamp. You'll get neck deep in that. 
Fat George doesn't blow his nose without its a God-given right, clear and simple. Why? I think the meanest, lowest thing about these wars they fight in Europe is the way both parties to the affair have guard, God marching shoulder to shoulder with them. Now, if that isn't blasphemous, I don't know what is, Granny snapped. Nothing of the kind. I respect my maker. I didn't invoke him. We wouldn't have the committee or need it either if God just handed out his rights left and right. When God made man, he gave him a mind to consider with and two hands to set things right. I was just putting it in a manner of speaking, Simmons protested. We can't afford to put things in a manner of speaking, Joseph. We have got to get to, we have got to set our line clear and prosper, pr- proper and prove it all the way. Oh, yes, the pastor will hold that our rights derive from God. That's his business. He has to. But you and me, we know well enough that it was only because of a lot of stiff-necked people like ourselves that we've got knowledge of rights. You consider my Uncle Cyrus in the rum trade. He says he'll die and see his ship and fortune sunk before he hands his trade over to the British. He has the right to trade with the islands because he backs up that right with his life. Same way, I hold this house of mine a castle in in Violet, but that's pure boasting unless the committee backs me up. Do you see? But Cousin Simmons was slow to see, and they went on discussing it over the pie and afterwards as they were preparing to leave the house. I stopped my father in the kitchen as they were leaving, and I said to him, I want to go with you to the meeting, father. Oh? I know that the committee made a rule about 16 years before a man enters. Are you a man now, Adam? I'm tall and strong and only nine months away from my 16th birthday. The proof of a man is the will to work and the ability to use his mind and his judgment. Can you offer that proof, Adam? I stared at him in silence. Talk to me when you can, Adam. Then they both left. Granny said that there was no more pure nonsense connected with the committee meeting than a body could bear, and she didn't see why I would want to waste the evening hours there. My mother put her arms around my shoulders. Why does he hate me so? I asked them. Hate you, mother said. Adam, he loves you. You're his son. Then I got love and hate mixed up. What a way to talk. How do you expect me to talk? Has he ever said a kind word to me? He chops at me like I was an old dry pine for him to temper his axe on. Whatever I do, it's not right. And no matter how I do, do it. He finds fault. That's just his way. Is it? Well, it's not my way to like it. Granny said gently, oh, Adam, Adam, what a fuss to make over a cantankerous man who's enamored with the sound of his own voice. Moses Cooper is your father, and I suppose he can't ever be anything else than that to you. But to Goody Cooper here, he's just a son, just the same as you are, and he's, he's never been any different but the way he is now, pig-headed and full of his own notions. Do you think poor cousin Simmons could ever have written that statement to suit Moses Cooper? No, sir. Cousin Simmons might, might be the nicest, nicest guy and most delicate writer in all the country, county, but that wouldn't satisfy Moses Cooper. He'd find fault. All I ever ask from him is one kind word just so he'd look at me once, as if I wasn't dirt scraped out of the barnyard. He just expects more than a soul can deliver, Granny said. I pulled away from Mother and started toward the door. Where are you going, Adam? Out. Adam, don't press it. Don't go over to the church. If your father sees you there after he ordered you not to come, he'll be very angry. He's always angry. Anyway, I'm not going to bother their damned committee. Adam! I stalked out to the yard, and there was Levi crouching in the shadows. It was dark now. Adam? Go to hell, you little rat, I told him. You going to lick me, Adam? Did I ever lick you? No, but there's always a first time, Adam. There will be if you don't stay out of my sight.